Good morning and welcome back to The Human Advantage. We are on day two, a little beleaguered, but uh, very much ready to talk to a lot more uh, speakers and interact with you over the chat and over SparkUp today. As those of you who were with us yesterday learned, yesterday was all about behavior, about the theory behind behavioral science, about the application of behavioral science, and today we're turning a bit of a page. We're focused on artificial intelligence. As you'll see today in the lineup, today is all about making things better. Better decisions, better choices, better business. So we're going to really think about today, how do we leverage AI to slightly improve all that we do? We want to thank you for being here. We saw so many of you online yesterday. I checked in with, with our team. We had people joining us from Pakistan, from Paris, from London, from Rome, from Milan, from Singapore. We saw our colleagues in Singapore having a bit of a viewing party. So we really are happy that you're here with us yesterday. We're glad you're joining us here again today. We want to say thank you to our academic stars. You met many of them yesterday, Cass Sunstein, Hilke Plasman, uh, Pierre Chandon. Today you're going to meet Olivier Siboni this morning, along with many others throughout the day. So stay tuned to hear from our academic uh, leaders in the field. But also, yesterday you met a lot of the top practitioners, taking behavioral science, taking artificial uh, intelligence into the field, applying it to businesses, applying it to public policy, et cetera. No different today. Today you're going to hear from many practitioners across multiple businesses, from banking and finance, um, from data analytics, from fast-moving uh, consumer goods. So stay tuned. Keep up with the program online, and you'll find us here. A special shout to Adrien Liard, our illustrator, who's already getting warmed up, as if he didn't do enough for us yesterday. Adrian is our uh, digital illustrator. He provides us with the sketch notes that you will receive after the fact, about a week from today, with the links to the recordings as that visual aid about the key topics that we're discussing throughout the day. You will see us checking in with Adrian as we move from session to session. Again, thanks to the diverse audience. As I mentioned, we saw people logging in from all over the world. We have more than 2,400 of you registered. O over 80 countries, so we're really glad that you're here. And speaking of all over the world, we want to say hello to all of our BVA colleagues. Again, we see you logged in. We see you with your watching parties. The BVA Group is a global market research and consulting business with offices all over the world. And a little bit about what we do. One of our core businesses is around insights with our colleagues at BVA Excite here in France, BVA BDRC in the UK, where I'm based, BVA DOXA in Italy, and PRS and Vivo, the global pack and new product uh, research specialists. We also have our data factory. You'll hear from our colleague Estelle today, and our consulting team, where I work with Eric at BVA Nudge Consulting and BVA People Consulting. You met some of our colleagues from there yesterday, as well as Hubikis, who provide SaaS solutions. We have sector experts in tourism, utilities, retailing. You'll meet our colleague James later today, as well as many other sectors. The BVA group is a purpose-driven group. For those of you in France, that's an entreprise de mission. For our friends in Italy, a benefita. Or for where I'm from in the, U in the US, that's a, a B Corp. So our mission is to inform the decisions of people and organizations, to decipher the world and support clients to build effective solutions contributing to a positive future. That mission, paired with our passion for behavioral science, is how we came to the human advantage. We wanted to create an event for the growing interest and passion for behavioral science that we're seeing in the public and the private sector. That's why we make this event free. We can see, I'm checking in with, with Helen and Bertrand, my colleagues, we have CEOs logged in, we have students logged in, and that's the point of the human advantage, is really kind of evangelizing the power of behavioral science and AI and how we can all bring it into our daily lives, into our businesses, into our organizations. So that's why we're here. Again, as I mentioned, day two is really dedicated to artificial intelligence and the advantage that that can bring to all these human interactions. If you have any questions for us, we are in the chat at any time. If you have questions for our speakers, please put them in the chat. Those zip over to us and we can provide them to the speakers. As I mentioned yesterday, we're partnering with SparkUp and there will be some polls and some questions throughout the session. So do stay tuned there. Please participate in those polls. It really tells us a lot. So we're about ready to begin on day two. As you might mention, so far I've been flying solo. We are giving Eric a little bit of a rest today. It's a Friday after all. But I can't do this alone. We have a huge packed program again today. So I want to welcome my colleague Emily Boots. Joining me throughout today on day two is Emily. Emily's our Chief Innovation Officer at the group level at the BVA family. And Emily oversees innovations across all the BVA businesses as well as piloting tech solutions with partners and leading our transformation in regards to AI. 
Welcome, Emily. AI, I'm learning, but I'm going to need your help today. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. I'm very happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, AI, what a topic. I'm going to try to be as good as Eric is today, and <laughs> I think we have a really interesting topic, so that shouldn't be too hard. Um, I really hope it's going to be as interesting, even maybe more, as energizing. We have so many different speakers, uh, so many interesting topics around AI. AI, such a game changer, right? Uh, we've been, um, it's still early days, it's still very polarizing, but still, um, at BVA Family, we have been been um, piloting, experimenting uh, throughout the last few years, and we wanted to add this day to be kind of learning more through academics and through um, you know people who we've been experimenting with and sharing that knowledge with you guys. So I hope you find this day as interesting as we think it's going to be, and let's kick it off. Let's get started. So you just saw the first SparkUp poll on, on your screen as a little bit of a test, asking you if you were with us yesterday or if today's your first day for 2024 at the Human Advantage. We're going to get started with our opening keynote with Olivia Siboni. Stay tuned, we'll get, we'll get started in just a minute. Good morning, Olivia. Thanks for joining us at The Human Advantage. Good morning, it's my pleasure. Good to have you back, this time this in the flesh. <laughs> <person, yes. coughs> Great. So let me uh, let me introduce Olivier, who doesn't really need any introduction, but still I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> um, Olivier is um, currently professor at HEC, really famous school in Paris for those of you who are joining from um, other locations. Uh, he's also, uh, he used to be a partner in McKinsey for 25 years. He is uh, the author of many different books, which I have here. I will tell you the titles in French. Vous allez commettre une terrible erreur. You're going to make a terrible mistake. Vous allez redécouvrir le management. And the latest one, the co-author with uh, the late Daniel Kahneman and Cass Sunstein that we have seen yesterday, Noise. Right, so I am going to leave it to Olivier, who does a much better job at, <laughs> you know, introducing himself and talking <laughs> than me. So go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm not going to be introducing myself again. <laughs> uh, you've probably heard enough about me already. the The topic I'd like to talk about today is um, artificial intelligence, which, to be clear, is not the topic of my expertise. My uh, research, as you've just seen in my uh, writing, is about decision making. But the <coughs> question that I get all the time, and that of course you, you mentioned is a, a game changer, is how does artificial intelligence change our decision making? So what I'd like to cover is, if we can uh, move on to the slides, the um, topic of whether when it comes to decisions, <laughs> and when, when it comes to decisions, we can actually trust um, AI, and I call this decision-making in the age of AI. Yes, we are getting there. Um, we're not quite yet on my slides, if we can Just perhaps here. move on to them. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes, here they are. So, uh, so that's my slides. Sorry, coming back, yes. Um, so, basically, uh, as, as an introduction to this, the um, there's at least three ways to think of how we use AI these days. Um, and this is a typology that is not perfectly bulletproof or you know, watertight. You could s see something as being across these different categories, but essentially I, I view this as three buckets. One bucket is radical innovation, things that AI lets us do that humans were not able to do without AI. So there are a lot of things uh, that we hear about, for instance, in pharmaceutical development that is just amazing, and AI is going to be completely transformational. There's a second category of things, which is less, less exciting, but probably quite as impactful, if not more, from an economic standpoint, which is large-scale automation of tasks that were performed by humans, but that we will, in fact, be able to perform much more efficiently and much more effectively with AI. And that's where all the concern about jobs comes in. Those are the two topics I'm not going to talk about. The one I am going to talk about is where AI is used to support human decisions, where AI is used as decision aids. And in you know, this discussion, I would like to use a framework which we introduced in Noise, the book that we were showing a minute ago, which is that when we make 
judgments, when we make decisions, there's four possible things that can take place. We can be right, we can be correct, we can be accurate. So to understand that, imagine that you've got a team of people who are shooting at the same target, using, for instance, the same rifle, and they're shooting at the same target. If they're all shooting more or less in the center, which is what you see here, they're accurate. Now, there is a case that sometimes happens, which you've all heard about, which is that sometimes there is a bias, there is a shared error. So if your team of shooters, again, is shooting at the same target with the same rifle and they are biased, you will see a shared mistake. Here, they're all shooting in the same place. Perhaps the wind is blowing very strongly, or perhaps their rifle has a problem with the, um, uh, the, 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 the straightness of the, of the rifle. You know, there, there must be a reason there for, for the, these people to all make the same mistake, and that reason is what, in decision-making, we call a bias. But then there is something else, which happens a lot, which, in fact, when you're looking at a target at a shooting range, is much more common than a bias. It's what we call noise. It's a random error. And when there is a random error, it means that Perhaps on average we are correct, as in this case, or on average we are not correct, we can have both noise and bias. But the important thing is that there is dispersion, there is variability from one person to the next or fr from one moment to the next. Now when we think of decision making, the same thing can be true. We can have biases in decision making, we can have shared errors, but we can also have variability, random variability between people or between the same person at different times who are making a decision. Why does that matter to AI? Let me try to introduce three themes that I'd like to cover. Wha first of all, noise and bias impact differently the two systems, the two types of AI that we are um, dealing with these days. They, second, raise different challenges, and third, they raise different questions. So I would like to raise a few questions and leave you with those questions, starting with the two systems of AI. You probably have heard about the distinction between the, the old AI, or the good old-fashioned AI, as it's sometimes called, symbolic AI, and the new AI. Very simply, and again, not as an expert in this, but to summarize something that you've all heard about, the old AI is the logical application of rules based on symbolic representation of ideas. So when you have computers that play chess, when you're using ways to go from A to B, basically the computer is following a set of instructions. There's a lot of instructions, there's a lot of data, and basically it is giving you the best possible solution to uh, perform the task that has been assigned to the system. The problem with this is that it makes stupid mistakes because it can't deal very well with ambiguity. So when you have a self-driving car that sees the sign on the left, it does not understand it's a stop sign. When it sees the sign on the right, which is on the backpack of a child walking on the pavement, it thinks it is a stop sign and it stops stupidly. So symbolic AI is not very good at dealing with the, the real situations of real life that have some complexity in them. Which is why, uh, or which is why we are so excited these days about the new AI, the machine learning AI, which does not follow rules in the way of the old computers, but emulates the way our own brain works and feels therefore much more natural. And that's what the LLMs are doing, the large language models, the chat GPTs of this world. Now, why am I introducing this to you? Because in this audience, you will all be very familiar with system one and system two. And in fact, these two types of AI are very uh, resonant with the distinction between system one and system two. The old AI essentially works just like a system two. If it makes a mistake, it is a mistake that is based on having the wrong rules or having the wrong data. You can trace the errors back, the mistakes back to the uh, initial rules and data that are given to it. Basically, it's understandable, it's interpretable, you can debug it fairly easily. You understand how it works, and you expect it to work all the time, just like we expect a system two to, you know, of course, not be perfect, but to be understandable in the way it fails. System one, on the other hand, is the way we practice thinking and we practice even conversation every day, and it's much more natural, and it makes mistakes too, and those mistakes feel a lot more human. So when machine learning makes mistakes, those mistakes can be just as stupid as the mistakes of formal AI, but in fact, look a lot more human. Here's an example that I found extremely striking of how ChatGPT4 answers a completely stupid question. The stupid question is, give me a one-sentence accurate explanation of how genetic information 
encodes star formation. Now, this is obviously completely nonsensical. There is no genetic information in the stars. But the answer that ChatGPT will give you is very confident, very articulate, and sounds to someone who doesn't know what they are talking about completely plausible. In fact, this is what experts in AI call hal hallucinations. AI makes up stuff. But in fact, I would much prefer to call it plain old bullshit <laughs> or confabulation, as some people call it more politely. <laughs> in fact, AI behaves exactly in the same manner as a teenager who has been called in to the, the blackboard and who hasn't learned their lesson and who therefore is going to come up with something that is vaguely reminiscent of what the teacher was talking about during the lesson yesterday that may sound plausible enough for the kids at the back of the room who haven't learned their lessons either but who in fact is w which in fact is complete nonsense and that nonsense is very difficult to distinguish especially if you're among the kids at the back of the room who don't need who don't know what they're talking about is very difficult to distinguish from the correct stuff which is what makes the, the new type of AI, the large language models, so seductive and also so dangerous in the way we deal with them. In other words, and coming back to the framework of noise and bias, this is noise. This is not bias. There is no predictable mistake in those or predictable direction of error in those uh, systems. But there is a lot of variability that we really don't know how to deal with. And that variability comes in the two types of noise. The first is stability. So within the same model, you will get different answers. If you ask ChatGPT the same question twice, you will get different answers. And in fact, very interestingly, if you ask ChatGPT why its answers vary fr from one time to the next, its answer, confoundingly, is because I'm trying to look more human. It will actually tell you, we, I, I, my answer is incorporates a degree of randomness and variability. This is designed to make conversations seem more natural. We know that humans are, in fact, completely unreliable and vary from one moment to the next. So in order to make ChatGPT look human and feel human, we've, in fact, made it just as un unreliable as humans to introduce by, by introducing an element of randomness. That's the first thing. And of course, uh, ChatGPT does not know the truth. And if you ask one large language model or, or another large language model, you will get different answers because their process for figure out figuring out what is true and what is not true is deeply unreliable, as you can see from the lengthy and convoluted answer that you see here when you ask ChatGPT about what is true. The answer is ChatGPT has no idea what is true. These two reasons mean that fundamentally, you should never trust a large language model. You can never completely entrust a decision to a large language model, which is why a lot of people will tell you, beware of AI, don't trust <coughs> AI too much, and so on and so forth. There is just one problem with this conclusion. And the problem is that this is also true of human beings. <laughs> the, the reason ChatGPT is unreliable here are exactly the same reasons we are unreliable. So the point here is we can't trust a large language model or AI in general for the same reasons that we can't trust a human being. So let's explore, now that we've got this um, landscape of the two systems of AI, let's explore the challenges that this form of unreliability raises when we're talking about decision aids. And I'd like to ask three questions and to get your thoughts about some of those questions. The first question is how to make AI acceptable. Why don't we use AI more, in fact, is the question. Here's some research that is very old, that predates AI by decades. In fact, the summary, the meta-analysis that you see here, I think is dated 1996. Uh, and it's a meta-analysis of hundreds of studies that were done in the previous decades. So we're to talking about a lot of research that is from the 1960s. And the Godfather of all that research is Paul Meal, who studied how human judgment compares with algorithmic judgment or with formulas. At the time, the algorithms that we're talking about are very, very rudimentary formulas. And the sorts of contests that are being organized between humans and formulas are questions like, will this sentenced criminal recidivate? Will this person survive the disease that they've been diagnosed with? Will this student succeed at the school that they're applying to? Will this person be successful in the job that we're hiring for? All these problems are prediction problems for which experts, human experts, judges, doctors, recruiters, 
admissions officers in universities are deploying their great experience and expertise to make a judgment about each individual case. And on each of those questions, you can come up with some sort of formula based on a few indicators. Usually it's a very simple linear model. So you basically take a couple of numbers and add them up. And that gives you a score. And the question is, is the human better than the score? And you can see that the answer is no. It's a resounding no. The human is usually not as good or just as good, but very rarely better than the formula. That's a finding that has been established for a long time in a very wide variety of areas, and that has been essentially ignored. All the experts that, are tha that we're talking about here keep doing the same stuff that they were doing before and not using those formulas. Why? Because those formulas are very unpopular. Decision makers like to retain their power to make decisions. Why are these formulas better? Because we are noisy, because from one case to the next we are not consistent, whereas the algorithm the rule, the formula, however rudimentary, however simple, however simplistic even, is always noise-free. That's why an algorithm, on average, always tends to be better than the human, because the human will vary a lot, and the algorithm, even if it's not brilliant, will, vary, will be so consistent that it will avoid the noisy errors. So, why don't we, the first question that I'd like you to give some thought to, is why, don't we why do we continue to trust human judgments? Why don't we use AI more in so many domains where a formula is demonstrably superior? Why do we keep, for instance, deciding who is admitted to university and who isn't based on holistic judgments of admissions officers who read essays and who combine those essays with the scores of tests and with the assessments that are done in interviews and so on. Why do we in job interview, why do we continue to practice job interviews at all? Unstructured job interviews are a very noisy and very unreliable way of making hiring decisions that has been known for a very long time and yet just about every HR professional that I talk to tells me that they wouldn't give up this method. In fact, to be transparent, I wouldn't give up this method either, <laughs> despite the fact that I have read all this research. We are deeply committed to our own judgment as a way to make decisions. We are very passionate about remaining in control of our own decisions, even when we are told that, on average, the AI is better. That is the first question that I would invite you to think about. How high should the bar be for AI to supplement or to replace your judgment. If you think AI needs to be perfect to be better than you, you probably overestimate yourself a little bit. So AI cannot be perfect in all the fields that we're talking about because they are predictive fields. We expect it to be perfect, we want it to be perfect, but it cannot be perfect because the future is unpredictable. It doesn't have to be perfect to be better than you. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, how good are we really? How high, therefore, should the bar be for AI to be better than we are? The second question is, is it true that humans should always remain in control of AI? And that is something on which I would, in fact, like you to give me your thoughts. Here's a poll. Uh, I'm going to ask you to choose between the following three options. For your most important business decisions, for your most important business decisions in the future, will AI replace you and make the decisions most of the time? Will it assist you while you will remain in charge? Or will it be irrelevant to you and not be able to assist you? Let's give you uh, a couple of seconds, I guess, to see how many people We'll give it a moment. Answer. As our audience, um votes there, Olivier, I just want to say thank you for giving me a better word, confabulation. I think I did a lot of that through junior high school and a bit of high school, but yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, you seem to have confabulated very effectively. Got, got out, got out That got you here. <laughs> right. So we can see the answer is coming up here, and there is an overwhelming majority of people answering B. In fact, each time I have um, use this poll, I find about 90 or 95% of the people answering B. The overarching theme that we hear about AI is it's very important that humans remain in control. If we can move on to the next slide, we're going to see you know, lots of um, 
articles and uh, reports and government directives, etc., saying that humans should remain in control. We need to keep it in check. Humans need to stay at the center of decision making. Humans must stay in control of AI. In fact, this in even informs regulations, European and other regulations that um, want to ensure human control over AI-infused systems. This is, of course, very understandable and very sensible, right? No one wants to become the, the puppet of an AI system that is manipulating human beings. But here is the paradox that this raises when we're talking about decision making, about decision aids. If AI makes better judgments than we do, why should we remain in control of AI and why should we remain in control of decisions? And how do we know when we should yield to AI and when we should override AI? The risk, if we say we remain in control, if we follow the logic of the people who answered B in the previous question, which is, I'm going to use the AI as a decision aid, but I'm going to be the final decision maker. The risk is that there is really two scenarios. Either the model agrees with you, the AI agrees with you, and you're very happy and you're just confirmed in your pre-existing belief. So you're essentially using AI as a confirmation bias engine as a way to strengthen your confidence in what you already believed, which may or may not be correct. Or the AI disagrees with you, and when the AI disagrees with you, you choose to ignore the AI, because if it disagrees with you, it must be wrong. Now, if that is what you're doing, if that is what you intend to do when you answer question B, what this really means is that you're wasting your time with AI. Because if the AI is better than you are on average at making those decisions, if it is more accurate than you are on average, it must be because there are cases where you disagree with the AI and the AI is right and you are wrong. If there were no cases where the AI is right and you are wrong, it couldn't possibly be better than you on average. So it's precisely when you disagree with the AI that you should trust the AI. And if you choose to remain in control on a case-by-case -case basis and to say, whenever the AI disagrees with me, I will decide whether or not to override the AI, and most of the time you will override the AI, you are in fact setting yourself up for making more confident wrong decisions in some cases and slightly less confident but equally less decisions in other cases, which is not a great way to use AI. Does that mean that we should always believe whatever AI tells us? No. Here's what it means in practice. We should distinguish between trusting a model and trusting a recommendation from a model. At the level of the model, there are, of course, very good reasons to distrust a model. A model should be quality controlled, it should be practical, it should be legal, obviously. It should not create skill atrophy, so it should not make you incapable of making those decisions by yourself. It should not be biased. Those are very important things. So you should not trust a model that has not met these uh, very high standards that, that has not been tested against these standards. However, if the reason you distrust a model is because it lacks human wisdom or because it is a black box or because it makes stupid mistakes, these aren't in and of itself good enough reasons. Of course, models make mistakes. Those mistakes will look stupid to you. By the way, your mistakes, your human mistakes probably look stupid to the model as well. The problem is not whether it makes mistakes, it's whether it makes fewer mistakes and less severe mistakes than you do. If it does, it is a good model. So once you have decided that you do use a model, does that mean that you should always, tr always trust the model and never override it? No, but the cases in which you should override it are very few. There are the cases that Paul Meal again, the godfather of all the research on humans versus formulas that I was talking about earlier, that Paul Mill used to call broken legs, the cases where you know something about a case that is decisive and that the model does not know. Why is it called a broken leg? It's a funny story because the example Mill was using is the example of a model that predicts whether you're going to go to the movies tonight. That is generally very right, but you just happen to know that Mr. X has broken a leg this morning and is immobilized in a hip cast, so you pretty much know that he's not going to go to the movies, and you know that the model does not know that, so in that sort of case, you can and you should override the model, but just because you don't like the answer of the model, just because you think you know better, is absolutely not a reason to override the model. In those cases, you should trust the model. That really raises a very important question. When should you trust a model? 
both at the level of the model and at the level of each recommendation of the model? And what does it take for us to be able to be comfortable that we can trust the model. This is especially important, by the way, for business people, because a lot of the AI models that are being offered on the market to make important business decisions seem very compelling, but the way they are tested in the, in, 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 in the, in the field by the professionals who are going to use them is not always as systematic as it should be. Uh, often I have seen people tell me that they trust a model based on just a few cases without fully understanding how it works, which is of course very difficult, and also without having done a proper statistical test of the validity of those models. So that's a very important concern, and uh, I think it should get a lot more attention from especially business people than it is getting right now. The third question that I wanted to very briefly touch on is the question that we hear a lot about, the question of biases in AI system, algorithmic bias. And if you read the press about AI, there is a lot of concern and a lot of very legitimate and understandable concern about the risks that AI will hardwire or sometimes even reinforce some of the biases that we see in society. And to be clear, those biases are real, they exist. Now, let's be clear why they exist. Why did, for instance, in a famous example, Amazon develop a hiring tool that was considered sexist because it was hiring a lot more men than women? Because, evidently, the algorithm has been trained on real data. The real data that it has been trained on is who has been hired by Amazon, who has been successful at Amazon, and the algorithm in this example apparently had learned that to be successful at Ham Amazon historically, it was quite helpful to be a man and quite unhelpful to be a woman. So the algorithm being asked to optimize for an outcome, which is how do we find people who are going to be successful at Amazon, looked at the people who had been successful at Amazon in the past, said, you know, what does it take, and concluded, not explicitly, by the way, because obviously it does not have gender information, that would be illegal, but because the algorithm is very smart, it can figure out that you know, Joe, uh, Joe who plays uh, hockey is probably a man and uh, Brenda who does something else is probably a woman. So the algorithm was recommending a lot more men. So Amazon, of course, horrified that it was using a sexist AI tool, scrapped that tool. Here's the problem that this raises. What the algorithm is really telling you here is that you have been sexist in your human-based hiring in the past. Essentially, the algorithm is holding a mirror to you of your past decisions. If you say, I don't like what I see in that mirror, and therefore I'm going to break the mirror, do you suddenly look better? You know, do you look better because you break the mirror? No. What you should do is say, oh, the mirror is showing me something that I don't like. What I should do is not revert to my old ways. What I should do is change the way I'm making those decisions. And there's two ways to do that. You can try to change all the human decisions one by one. You can try to educate and train and support with nudges and tools all your recruiting uh, officers throughout a company of hundreds of thousands of people. That's a great endeavor and it's certainly worth trying. Or you could, in fact, try to use an AI tool that is designed to reduce or to some degree to eliminate some of the biases that you have had in the past. Now, that raises a lot of specific challenges. Um, just to, to name just two, the first challenge is since in many countries you are not allowed to use the information that would be the basis for discrimination, how are you going to make sure that your AI is not you know, discriminating, for instance, on the basis of gender? The second and even more troubling challenge is if you are going to set targets for being unbiased, what exactly constitutes bias? If, for instance, I'm going to make up numbers here, but if company X, I'm not talking about Amazon, if company X discovers that it had been hiring only 30% of women, and it says we want to change that, we're going to set a target and hardwire it in our AI system so that it's going to be 40% because it will be better. It's fair to ask, why 40, why not 50? And by the way, if you say 50, it's also fair to ask, you know, why not 60 since in the past it was 30 and that was not enough and you've got some catching up to do. That's a very difficult decision to make. That's a very difficult political choice to make. And it's much more comfortable not to make that choice, not to 
create a hierarchy of your criteria, not to say we're prepared to compromise on this dimension because we want to have that dimension, or we are prepared to set this target because this quota is important to us. So rather than making that difficult decision, it's much more comfortable to revert to your old ways and to say, we are going to trust humans because it is less apparent less visible that you have biases when you trust you and trust those decisions to humans. But unfortunately, the biases are not minimized, they are still there. So the question this raises is, how do you define good decisions? How do you uh, set the rules for what you're trying to achieve in those decisions? And how do you make sure that you're going to have the right priorities hardwired in the algorithms that you use? To summarize, this raises three questions for you as users of decision aid AIs, and also three questions <coughs> that are the mirrors of those three questions for regulators. To summarize what we've talked about, we are not as good as we think, so the question you should ask yourself is, how good are your decisions without AI? Practically speaking, this means auditing the quality of your past decisions before you introduce AI to make them. To take the classic example, hiring decisions. I have met very, very few organizations where people can answer the question, how good are your hiring decisions on average? On whatever test that you apply, you know, how many of the people you hire are still around two years later? That's a very basic test, right? It's certainly not a very high bar to meet, but very few people are able to answer that question you know, other than in, in very broad aggregate. So, as an individual recruiter, am I better or worse on that indicator than the other recruiters in my company? I usually don't know. If I don't know that, how am I to decide whether an AI system that is right X percent of the time is better than me? It's of course very easy to say, if the AI system is right 80% of the time, it's wrong 20% of the time, that's entirely unacceptable, I cannot trust it. But if I am right 60% of the time, that's an opportunity to reduce errors by half that I am giving up on. So how good are you without AI? Probably not as good as you think. Second, how good can the AI decisions be? How good will the model be? And how do you measure the quality of the forecasting or the prediction that the model is making? Um, that's something that should be tested seriously and professionally and not just by a few uh, instances as some um, cases unfortunately suggest. And third, what will you tell AI to look for? What are the criteria that you will use in your decision making? How will you formalize those criteria, which are right now usually ambiguous because there is multiple criteria and they are not weighted or um, hierarchized in any formal way? How will you tell AI what you really care about in a much more formal and much more organized way than you do today? In other words, how will you structure your decisions in a way that is understandable by a model. The flip side of those questions for regulators are very important. First of all, what applications should be regulated? Where does it actually matter that we are worse or better than AI and that AI should be good enough to be used? Second, who should validate AI <coughs> models? Who should, who should I trust as a user and who should the regulator tell me is trustworthy when it comes to saying this model is bias free, for instance, and what is the definition of bias that we're going to use in this. And finally, what constitutes bias? That is a very uh, tricky technical question. What constitutes bias in an algorithm? What constitutes a bias that I can be held accountable for? If, if, if I'm going to use a, a model and that model has uh, a demonstrable bias, of course, that is a responsibility that, should be, um, uh, you know, th th that I should be accountable for. But for that responsibility to be, um, for that accountability to exist, there needs to be definitions of bias that are shared. And those definitions today are still shaky. So um, this makes for exciting times for people who want to use AI and for people who are developing AI systems, obviously. Um, and uh, hopefully that will trigger at least some questions. So let's Thanks, hear those questions. That's really great. I want to go back to your very first slide where you talk about there's three types of AI, right? Automation, radical innovation, and decision aids. My feeling, maybe my bias, is that the media and maybe the kind of average Joe like us are obsessed with the first two. Yes. And thinking a lot less about decision aids. When actually I think about when I use AI, 
I'm probably using it as a decision aid much more than I'm actually radically innovating and I haven't automated much of anything in my life. W what do you think that's about? Why the fixation on automation and radical innovation and instead of decision aids, which probably everyone in every job in every life could use decision aids? One word. Science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I think we are. You yeah. know, we're all you know, obsessed with the the science fiction representations of AI and robots and yeah. and, and crazy machines that dominate the world, mm -hmm. um, and it's a much more exciting topic for dinner conversation than. Or know, the tabloid news. <laughs> this, this, yeah, for, or for tabloids, <laughs> then decision aids to decide whether we should hire you know, Joe mm -hmm. or Mary in the accounting department. Yeah. Yeah. But that's you know, the sort of decision yeah. that companies are going to be uh, yeah. automating a lot, and are already automating a lot yeah. using AI, so we should care about those. Yeah. And, you know, Olivier, what's holding people back from using more AI-informed decision aids? You know, why are we, apart from maybe just habit, there are opportunities to use some of these informed decision aids. Some of them aren't even that new. Yeah. What's holding us back? So I think the, the first reason is that we, uh, the first reason is over overconfidence. We, we think we're great at making those decisions, so yeah. why would we need a decision aid? Because we're perfect, right? <laughs> uh, which is why the first challenge that I'm putting here is, you know, ask yourself how good you actually are by actually measuring the quality of your decisions. I'll give you an example from the world of medicine. Uh, there is a study that has been done following the book Noise by um, a number of um, neurologists, and in fact, epileptologists, so mm -hmm. epilepsy specialists, mm -hmm. who are looking at uh, the quality of the, the, the noise, the variability in the diagnosis of epilepsy specialists on a very, you know, not easy but simple decision, which is does this person have epilepsy or not? Mm -hmm. They've been showing the same case to multiple epilepsy specialists among the best in the world. And they were very surprised by the level of noise that they find, right? Mm -hmm. So when those epilepsy specialists look at their results, their you know, collective results, they say, well, obviously, if we disagree on whether this case has epilepsy or not, one of us must be right and the other must be wrong. Mm -hmm. So the rate of error, you know, regardless of who is right and who is wrong, the rate of error is higher than we thought. These very people were saying, you know, the formulas that are proposed to us today to evaluate whether someone has epilepsy are not great. They make mistakes. We can't trust them. Mm -hmm. The question now becomes, do they make fewer mistakes than we do which may not be what we thought mm -hmm. before. So that I think that's the first question, and it's a very difficult process for people to become aware of the, mm -hmm. the quality of their own decisions. There is a second reason, though, which is that all things being equal, the rate of error being equal, we very much prefer the error to be made by a human <laughs> than to be made by a machine. We expect machines to be perfect. We have a mental s schema that is that a machine should be perfect. When you walk into the elevator and you press 7, you expect to get on the 7th floor 100% of the time. You don't expect that sometimes it's going to go to the 6th and sometimes to the ninth, and sometimes not move, mm -hmm. right? And when we're talking about decision aids in a world that is uncertain, when we're talking about the future, uncertainty is not going away. Uncertainty is in the world. It's not in the model. So we need to learn to deal with models, with AIs, that are going to be wrong some of the time. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, is that some of the time less of the time than we are wrong? And if the answer is yes to that, then we need to become comfortable with AI making mistakes. But right now, our, our reaction to machines is, if it makes one mistake, I'm going to discard it. You know, the classic example of that, if you remember the first GPS that you had in your car, mm -hmm. which probably wasn't very good, right? You played with it twice, and then you put it back in the glove compartment and said it's completely useless. Mm -hmm. Now, if your spouse was sitting next to you and reading the map oh. and making two mistakes, you didn't tell them, you know, you know <laughs> go away, let's have a divorce because you <laughs> made two mistakes, <laughs> right? So we are much more tolerant of human mistakes than we are of machine mistakes. So I, I think it's those two things. It's overconfidence about how good we are and differential, differential tolerance for, for mistakes. And now there's no maps in our cars at all. There's just GPS. No, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, we have a couple questions coming in from, from the audience who are online. Um, one of them asked, what could be done with high risk business decisions when the human and the AI have different levels of risk aversion? That's not a particularly easy question. No, but it is so the one that got the most <laughs> votes, so I'm, I'm being democratic to those of you who are online. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's separate two questions here. 
Yeah. Uh, what is the right level of risk? Uh, what is the risk appetite mm -hmm. that you want to have? Yeah. And what is the right decision given that risk appetite? Uh, let's take a simple example. You're about to launch a new business or launch a new venture, or launch a new product. Let's make this simple, yeah. right? This product has a certain probability of success, whatever it is. In some companies at some points in time, it's fine to say, you know, it has a 40% chance of success, but you know, we it's throw a lot of things on the wall and see what sticks and you know, we are prepared to cut our losses if that doesn't work. In other companies, at other points in time, it's a very big launch and you don't want to launch something or perhaps you are out of cash and you can't afford uh, the, the, the failure or perhaps you are a CEO who is under scrutiny mm -hmm. and you can't afford the, the egg on your face. You know, for whatever reason, you have a much higher expectation or a much lower tolerance for risk. Now, what an AI system should tell you if it is properly used is not go uh, or, or don't go, it's what is the probability of success, mm -hmm. right? If the, if the AI system tells you this product has a 60% chance of success, in the first case, you should go for it. In the second case, you shouldn't go mm -hmm. for it. The AI shouldn't tell you go or no go. It should give you a probability mm -hmm. of you know, being successful. Mm -hmm. The decision on how much risk you want to take is your decision to make before you use a decision aid. Yeah. I think that's something that is not always uh, clear because people don't think probabilistically as much as they should about those things. So if we start to think of the world as probabilistic and think of AI as giving us probabilities, not recommendations, mm -hmm. then it <coughs> becomes a lot easier to uh, separate those yeah. two issues. Somewhat linked to that, I, I thought it was interesting in your presentation when you talked about, you know, we, we could be building AI or we could be using AI, maybe is a better way for me to say, as just a confirmation bias engine. Do yeah. you see that as one of the biggest risks of how AI might be adopted? Oh yeah, AI and decision aids in general. The, the, mm -hmm. you know, when, when I ask people how they use decision aids, the answer I get most often is, oh, I only use it as one data point mm -hmm. in a set of things that I use. Now that's the same answer I would be getting 20 or 30 years ago when I asked people who, who were doing recruiting about graphology. <laughs> you know, graphology yeah. you know, is the science or the, the pseudoscience of yeah. looking at your handwriting and reading your personality in your handwriting. And when I was asking you know, executives, you know, how do you use this you know, doubtful input, their answer was always, oh, you know, it's just one data point. You know, as, as part, it's so difficult to make hiring decisions, nothing can be completely useless, right? And every data point is useful when we're making such a difficult decision, so why not use it as one additional data point? Well, it's actually very dangerous to use one bad input, one unreliable input, whether it's graphology or AI, I don't care, but to use an additional input that is not intrinsically reliable as a so-called additional input is simply a way to give you more confidence in your initial hypothesis, which may be your gut feeling or maybe the result of whatever your process you followed, it essentially will bolster your sense of confidence in your ingoing hypothesis. You're essentially setting yourself up for confirmation bias. I'm very glad that graphology has fallen out of fashion because my handwriting, <laughs> we say in the US, you should have been a doctor. I have not been to yes. medical school. I just have terrible handwriting. Emma, I think you had a question about noise. I do. Do we yeah. have enough time? We do. Yeah, we're okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering whether, I mean, noise usually has a negative perception. Can it be turned into something positive? Can it be used in a positive way? So variability can be positive. When it's positive, we don't call it noise, <laughs> <laughs> that which avoids the negative right, uh, perception yeah. that you have. A lot of judgments benefit from variability. If you're trying to be creative, you want to create divergence, you want to create variability. If you are trading in a market, you want to have a different view of the value of what you're dealing with, the, pri the, the, the intrinsic value of what you're selling than the people who are buying. If, if there is no disagreement, there can't be any trades. So there are situations where you want people to think differently from one another because that is the engine of later selection think of the Darwin, Darwinian process, right? There is variation, then there is selection. Yeah. Variation is good when there is going to be selection. And that is limited to those two examples that I was giving you. Mm -hmm. Creativity or innovation and markets, you know, simply put. You know, there is a, a few other edge cases. But in all the other decisions, which are the overwhelming majority of decisions that we make, you know, should we hire this person or not? There is a correct answer to that. You know, either this person is the best candidate that we have today, or they are not. And if you and I disagree about that, 
it's not diversity, creativity, you know, wonderful. One of us must be wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm. Whenever a question has a correct answer, if two people disagree, one of them must be wrong. Right? So you know, variability is good when a question does not have a correct answer and when we're exploiting the variability of those answers to get to some sort of advantage. But that is a small uh, subset of all the decisions that we're making when we're deciding who to hire, whether to launch a product, what candidates to uh, bring into university, it's not so great. And when you go to two doctors and they give you two diagnoses, you don't say, oh, how wonderful creativity <laughs> is. <laughs> right? You, <laughs> you say one of these two guys must be wrong, perhaps yeah. both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm watching my puppet masters. I do want to ask one more question because it's, it's shot up to the, to, the, to the top of the list. And given that so many of our colleagues at, at, at the BVA family and so many of the people in our audience are attached to the insights industry or the market research industry, a question for you. To keep their jobs, what should market researchers and insights professionals prepare for the age of AI? I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, um, the, the, this, uh, to me, this falls into the second bucket of AI applications. You know, mm -hmm. How does AI mm -hmm. try to automate or to replace mm -hmm. humans in many of the tasks that they are performing? Um, and this is not something I have studied extensively, so I, I, I honestly yeah. don't know. Or let me try to pivot that a little bit, in that market researchers and insights professionals are oftentimes taking data, qualitative data, quantitative data, academic data, and making pretty strong recommendations to clients. And you, as an ex-McKinsey guy, if we think about decision aids then, rather than me being replaced by AI, but me <laughs> utilizing AI-informed decision aids as a researcher, as a consultant, any, any top tips for our, for our audience? So, uh, I, I'm not sure it's a top tip, but mm -hmm. as, uh, and, and, and I, I speak with the bias of someone who's been an advisor and a mm -hmm. consultant for a long time. I think at the time of pressing the button on a decision, a human being, has a very deep need for another human being to be there and to hold their hand and to tell them this Good is job. the right thing to Good do. Good job, Emily. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, go ahead. We, mm -hmm. we, we've thought about this. I've been your sounding board on this. Mm -hmm. And this is sometimes a coach. This is sometimes a spouse. This is sometimes a colleague. This is sometimes a consultant. And this is sometimes a market insights mm -hmm. specialist who tells them, you know, I'm your trusted advisor in this. So mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the broad idea here is it's going to be less and less the technical skills mm -hmm. that are going to make those kinds of advisors valuable uh, because a lot of those technical skills are going to be you know, uh, supplemented by AI. It's going to be more and more the interpersonal skills and the, the, the counseling, the advising skills as opposed to the consulting or, or technical skills. Yeah. Or even that storytelling of pulling together those data points, etc. And that yeah. in the storytelling yeah. is clearly part of the, of the advisory of the trusted advisor uh, skills that you need to have. Great. Thank you so much, Olivier. A great opening to the beginning of day two. We're just getting started talking about AI. Stay tuned. Our next session is going to carry on from that last question, talking about the field of market research and insights. So stay tuned, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>